Our scripture lesson for this evening, dear friends, is found, as it has been now for 30 times in this 1994, is found in the book of Revelation. We have been working our way at times, a couple of verses by a couple of verses, at times, chapter by chapter, or section by section. We have found ourselves this evening in the last several verses of Revelation chapter 11. I invite you to turn there with me, if you would. Revelation chapter 11, we have now come to the conclusion in the 15th verse of the so-called interlude between the sounding of the sixth and seventh trumpets of judgment. We begin then this evening in Revelation 11 verse 15, and we read through the end of the chapter, hear the word of the Lord. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. As always, dear friends, I urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look at our text together this evening. <clears throat> dear congregation of Jesus Christ, do the terms V-E day and V-J day mean anything to you? <laughs> well, I suppose that to many of us they probably do, especially if we are numbered among those of what we might term World War II vintage. For you see, brothers and sisters, VE Day stands for Victory in Europe Day. It was a day, as many of us know, I can see by the nods, was first celebrated on May 8, 1945, following the surrender of Germany to the Allied forces toward the close of World War II. VJ Day, which stands for Victory Over Japan Day, was first marked on September 2, 1945. It was the day on which Japan finally and formally surrendered after the Allied dropping of atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, brothers and sisters, interestingly enough, as we, as individual believers, go down through the years and live our lives, or as a church of Jesus Christ, as a congregation of Jesus Christ, and yes, as the church of Jesus Christ corporately goes down through the years, we face, do we not, many times of pain, times of persecution, times of pressure, times of, of trial and tribulation. Indeed, this is true. These things have and will continue to occur. That's what the Bible says. Yet interestingly and gloriously enough, the Bible also says that as individual believers and as a church of Jesus Christ, we can also collectively look forward to our own V-Day. Our own V-Day. How so? 
Well, you see, as we look to Revelation 11 this evening, we find ourselves being both instructed and inspired by the fact that just as the Allied forces of World War II looked forward to their day of victory in Europe and their day of victory over Japan, so too, the Bible says, the day will surely come when the church of Jesus Christ can and will look forward to and ultimately experience our victory over sin and our victory over hell and our victory over death and our victory over Satan. The Bible says that this day will be ushered in, the day, upon the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment. Now friends, let's look then to the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment as it is recorded for us in Revelation 11, verses 15 and following. And as we do, we will note first of all that the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment will usher in a time of great rejoicing. A time of great rejoicing. How so? Well, let's go to our text then in Revelation 11, beginning in verse 15, where we read, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Now, if you've got a different version than AIV, the words his trumpet may be italicized. Reason is that those words, his trumpet, are not found in the original manuscripts. They are implied or inferred from the text and are appropriate in the translation, but they are not in the original Greek. It literally just says the the seventh angel sounded, okay? But we can read it thusly. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, notice, and there were loud voices in heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, you may recall that we read previously in Revelation 8, verse 1, that upon the opening of the seventh seal, recall the scroll with the seven seals, when the seventh seal was opened, we read in Revelation 8 verse 1, that there was silence in heaven. But here, not so. Indeed, by way of contrast, upon the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we read that there were loud voices in heaven, notice, which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And He will reign forever and ever. Now friends, let's notice a couple key points here. First of all, look very, very carefully at those two words that are first of all in quotation marks. The kingdom of the world. The kingdom singular. Not the kingdoms plural. As I believe the King James Version may note. In my humble opinion, that's built on inferior manuscript evidence, and I believe this is a correct translation, singular, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Now, why is that significant? What is the difference between reading in the text the kingdom of the world or the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ? Well, the difference, is it not, concerns whether or not We will be looking in future times, let us say, at a mass Christianization of the nations of the world, as many believe will occur. Whether we are looking at, let us say, mass conversions or mass political action that will result in the conversion of political leaders throughout the world. A massive turning of scriptural principles in the Word of God, putting that into political practice throughout the world. Christians seizing the reign of government and ruling, in effect, Christian nations throughout the world, and all of those individual nations now have become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that isn't what the text says, is it? It says the kingdom of the world. It is incorporating all of the kingdoms of the world into one. Why so? Well, as our Lord Jesus says in John chapter 12, 31, Satan is the prince of this world. And the inspired apostle John is referring to the nations of the world as being under one prince, as one leader. He is referring to the the pervasive permeation of the spirit of Antichrist throughout this planet. He is referring to the consequences of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden and the sin which has corrupted and polluted the entire human race. He is saying that this world could be viewed as a kingdom which is diametrically opposed to and antithetically set against the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A key, key element, every letter of the Scriptures, not just every word, every letter of the inspired Scriptures is critically important. The 
kingdom of the world, notice, has become, glory, hallelujah, the kingdom of our Lord. Now, generally in the New Testament, when we read Lord, it is a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. Not so here. Here it is referring, first of all, to God the Father. That is the reference here to Lord, the kingdom of our Lord. And how do we know that? Because the text goes on to say, and of His Christ. And of, the Greek says, His Christos. The Messiah would be, in the Hebrew, which is what Christos or Christ means, it means Messiah, would be Meshiach, means the same thing. The Anointed One. And as we saw last Lord's Day evening, uh, in uh, Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 12, Christ is the Anointed One because He has been anointed to be our chief prophet and teacher, our only high priest, and our eternal King. The Kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, notice, and He will reign forever and ever, as we recited in the words of the Nicene Creed in worship this morning, whose kingdom shall never end. Think of it. The kingdom of God will go on forever and ever, and He will reign forever and ever. But brothers and sisters, notice, not only is this glorious and eternal declaration and decree uttered here upon the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment, but look at verse 16 with me. And the 24 Elders, now we met these elders earlier, did we not? In Revelation 4, 4, they are seated on thrones before and around the throne of God. Who were they, do you recall? Well, we concluded that the 24 elders are in fact, yes, heavenly beings who help lead the worship of God before the throne. But we also concluded, did we not, that they represented the church of the ages. For example, they represented the days of the 12 patriarchs and the New Testament age of the 12 apostles. We have 24. The Bible says that the 24 elders, notice, who were seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to You, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Because you have taken your great power, your great dunamis, and have begun to reign. Now, friends, notice a couple of key things here also. For example, this phrase, who is and who was. Does that sound at all familiar to you? I use that for the salutation, for example, this evening. It's taken from Revelation uh, 1, verse 8. It's also found in Revelation 4, verse 8, but it's not identical. There's a key, key difference in what we read here and what we have read thus far concerning this phraseology in the book of Revelation. Did you catch how it is different? Well, let's look at that for a second. Turn back to Revelation 4, verse 8, for example. Revelation 4, verse 8. In Revelation 4, verse 8, we read, Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under his wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, do you see the difference? Who was and is and is to come is what we find in Revelation 1, 8 and Revelation 4, 8. But turn back now to our text. Here we read, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Why do we not read, and who is to come? The reason, brothers and sisters, is because while this is not yet the end of time, while this is not the day of the great white judgment throne, While it is still true that the church must do battle with the dragon and the beast, if you'll turn some pages ahead, that still must be ushered in. And by the way, just make a mental note of this. As the seventh seal ushered in the sounding of the seven trumpets of judgment, so too the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment will usher in the outpouring of the seven bowls of wrath. So we're not right at the very end of of time. And yet the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment makes the full declaration that while the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ was signed and sealed and delivered, if you will, at the cross and upon His resurrection and ascension, it is not until the sounding of the seventh trumpet that that reality is unveiled, if you will. It is uncovered, if you will. It is finally and firmly declared for all to hear and for all to see. He is ushering in the consummation 
of the kingdom of the God who was and who is. Not who is to come. He has come. He is revealing to us now the full power and glory of His eternal kingdom. And so, my dear, dear friends, I ask you, is it any wonder then that the loud voices were heard in heaven? Is it any wonder then that the 24 elders fell on their faces before the throne of God and worshipped Him and gave thanks? And it is any wonder then that you and I must long for and pray for the coming of that day when we ourselves will witness and experience the reality of the kingdom of this world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Is it any wonder that first of all here in our text we find that the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment will usher in a time of great rejoicing, of great and glorious rejoicing. That's first point. Second of all, as our text continues, we find that the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment will not only usher in a time of great rejoicing, it will also usher in a time of retribution. A time of retribution. How so? Well, let's go back to the Scriptures and discern. Look at verse 18 with me, if you will. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. Now, friends, let us not misunderstand. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we read, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress their truth in their wickedness. The wrath of God today is being revealed. But what John is referring to here is the full and final outpouring of the wrath of God upon this rebellious planet, especially as that will be made manifest to us in the seven bowls of wrath. So do not misunderstand that. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead. Not simply the time translated in the Greek chronos, where we get our word chronology from and the like. But it's the Greek word kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, is how we would transliterate it. Kairos is different than chronos. Kairos, as time, refers to the opportune time, the fitting moment, the fullness of the season. When the time had fully come, Galatians 4 says, God sent forth His Son. Now, friends, notice, why is this the fullness of time? Reason, it's the fulfillment of prophecy. For example, turn back to uh, Psalm 2 with me, if you will. Psalm 2. In the Old Testament, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Turn to Psalm 2. I had the joy and privilege today, which I often don't have, of uh, teaching the high school catechism class. And uh, in that class time today, we looked at the Scriptures, the inspired Scriptures, as they were filled with prophecy and fulfillment, specifically co concerning the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And just skim over Psalm 2 with me. For example, in those first couple of verses we read, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His Meshiach, against His Anointed One. Verse 4, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He rebukes them in His anger and terrifies them in His wrath, saying, I have installed my King on Zion, my holy hill. This is what is termed by theologians a messianic psalm. A messianic prophecy. A prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. And indeed, not only so, but it speaks specifically, does it not, of the nations warring against the Christ, of the nations rejecting Christ and mocking God's Word, crucifying the Son, ridiculing and blaspheming the Lord God Almighty, and God exercising His wrath against them. This was spoken prophetically. And now in our text, John refers to it historically upon the seventh trumpet of judgment. Let's go back then with that understanding to Revelation 11. And pick it up again now in verse 18 of our text. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The kairos, the fitting time, the opportune moment has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants. The Greek says your douloi, that's the plural of doulos, which is a bond servant, a slave of Christ, 
and for rewarding your servants, the prophets. Interesting. Throughout the book of Revelation, the prophets are oftentimes singled out for special favor, but not exclusively so. For example, the time for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, both those in heaven and those who remained at that time upon the earth, and those who reverence your name. Now, if you've got your own Bibles, friends, underscore that part and reverence your name. And believe me, it has a special bearing for young people. Why so? Well, while you're turning to Ecclesiastes 12, <laughs> I'll tell you why so. Turn, turn over there to Ecclesiastes 12. Young people, when I was in high school, um, the book of Ecclesiastes truly gripped my soul. Reason was, I generally like to learn from other people's mistakes. And uh, I would watch what other people did with their lives or what other students did in school. And if it cost them something it, that it shouldn't have cost them, if it got them into trouble, I'd make a mental note and say, remember not to do that. Well, that's true of life, you know. As a young person, you're, you're seeking to map out the future course of your life. And you're making value judgments and decisions that will affect you for as long as you live. And indeed, will affect you on into eternity. And you may be wondering if the way of fullness of life is the way of sexual immorality or of drunkenness or of drugs or drinking or, or money or materialism or whatever. Well, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you will find that Solomon had it all. Solomon lived a life of wine and women and wealth and wisdom in a measure that you and I could never experience. He had women by the thousands and gold by the ton. My young friends, never forget this, and indeed take special note of this. At the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, near the very end of his life, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, says this, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. It's true. The whole duty of man is to revere God, to fear God, and to keep His commandments. Why? Because He'll bring us into judgment. He will bring every deed, every word, every thought into judgment. And that's what's being spoken of here in our text. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. It is a day of wrath for the nations, it is a day of judging the dead. It is a day of rewarding His servants, the prophets, His saints, and yes, all those. He will reward those who reverence His name, both small and great. That means, brothers and sisters, whether we consider ourselves as having been or whether we consider ourselves as being great or small in the economy of the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter. God sees us. He knows what we do for Him, whether it's in public or behind the scenes in private. It does not go unnoticed. Our faithful service in the wee hours of the morning or the late hours of the night or in the quiet, quiet confines of a hospital room do not go unnoticed by God. Whether small and great, notice, and the time has come also for destroying those who destroy the earth. Now, friends, put all that together in verse 18 and try to understand the implications of the praise and the punishment that will be meted out on that day. Think about it. You know, has it ever occurred to you, as it has at times to me, that we in the Reformed tradition can be so afraid of falling into the error of works righteousness, and that is an error, but we can be so afraid of falling into the error of works righteousness that we neglect to understand all that the Bible has to say about the rewards, I'm just using scriptural language, the rewards God promises to give to His own. Have you ever thought about that? Now it's true. As Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 63 tells us, and I quote, the reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. And that is true. Do not forget that. The reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. But that does not change the fact as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, for example, turn over with me, if you will, to the first gospel account in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, for example. Matthew chapter 5, 11 and 12, look with me. Does not change the fact that Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 11, Blessed are you 
When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad because great is your what? Your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Turn over to Matthew 16 with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 16. Same gospel uh, account. Matthew 16, verse 24. Matthew 16, verse 24. We read that Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will what? Reward each person according to what He has done. In other words, my dear, dear friends, as the Lord Jesus says, and just look this over as I'm speaking, in Matthew 25, verses 31 and following, you can turn there for a second, I'll give you five seconds to to get there. As our Lord Jesus says in Matthew 25, verses 31 and following, If by the grace of God, and through faith in the name of Jesus, His Holy Spirit is so working in us, skim over verses 31 and following of Matthew 25, that we, for example, are actively and practically engaged in feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, and visiting those in prison, which, by the way, do we not have opportunity to do in this Christmas season through uh, Lady Circle, bringing uh, food month after month uh, for the Pequannock Food Pantry, as we have opportunity, do we not, uh, with the angel tree, gifts for the uh, children of prisoners, as we have opportunity, do we not, every Wednesday, to bring food or, or lose a couple of hours sleep for the homeless. We've got these opportunities and many others, do we not, throughout the daily living, if we, by the grace of God, are doing these things, this isn't my words, these are the words of Jesus, then we can look forward to, the Bible says, verse 34, hearing the King say to us on this great day, come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Glory, hallelujah, the gracious reward and inheritance that God gives to His own. We're found faithful in Him. It's true, it's what the Bible says. But my dear friends, the reverse is also true, is it not? If God has not given us the grace, if He has not given us the faith, if we have not so been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and our lives are characterized by not feeding the hungry, by not clothing the naked, by not welcoming the stranger, by not visiting those in prison. And by the way, umbrella this over everything I've just said, both in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. Then we can well look forward to hearing the words of Jesus as they are recorded in Matthew 25, verse 41. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, drop down to verse 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The point, brothers and sisters, is that it says in Matthew and it says in Revelation that our God is a perfect and just and impartial judge. And on that great day of judgment, He does not want to listen to your or my lame excuses as to why we committed sins of omission or sins of commission. He does not want to hear from you or from me that we were too tired or we were too busy or we were too whatever. We're talking about His kingdom. He doesn't want to hear as we are hearing throughout the media repeatedly today, I was born that way. The society made me that way. Or I was caught up in the rage or the riot or the emotion of the moment. God says, no way. He says, the day will come when the bill must be paid. And that is why in our scripture lesson in Revelation 11, turn back there with me again if you would. 
He says the time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding His servant, the prophets, the saints, all those who reverence His name, both small and great. And get this, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Upon my first reading of this this week, I said, oh no, an environmentalist text. What do I do with this? And I was in big trouble. <laughs> I thought God was going to find the polluters, you know, and, and, and that's not what this means. It's probably used that way by some, but it's not what it means. The Greek conveys a sense, listen carefully, of destroying, yes, but even more essentially, of corrupting, listen, of corrupting or ruining from within. Rotting from the inside out. Think of it. God will destroy those who destroy the earth. Those who take His creation that He declared was very good and have persisted and pursued the sin of our first parents in rebellion against God. They have corrupted the Creator order of things in relationships. They have corrupted the, the morality which God has set in eternal and natural laws. They have corrupted His eternal moral law, the Ten Commandments. And not only have they corrupted the creation, they have revolted against and blasphemed the Creator. So the Bible says on that day He will destroy those who destroy the earth. Friends, let's take a peek. We're not going to dwell on this. We're just going to take a peek ahead in the book of Revelation just for a moment. Turn over to Revelation chapter 20, just for a second. Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 11 with me, if you will. This sets, sets forth for us a little more of the fleshing out of this great day that is ushered in at the sounding of the seventh trumpet and it will come to complete fruition shortly thereafter. Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great white throne... And him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. He couldn't hide. And I saw the dead, great and small, same phraseology, similar phraseology to our text, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person, there is none accepted. Each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. My friend, is your name written in the book of life? By the grace of God, have you personally believed in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Is He yours tonight? And are you His? It's a critical question with eternal implications. Because the Bible says that upon the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment, it will be not only a day of distinct and glad rejoicing, it will also usher in a day of divine retribution. Divine retribution. Now, there's a final insight our text shares with us concerning the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment. And that, dear friends, is that the sounding of the seventh trumpet of judgment will also usher in a time of great reassurance. Great reassurance, rejoicing, retribution, and reassurance. How so? Let's go back as our text concludes. Revelation 11, verse 19. Then God's temple, recall from last Sunday evening, God's naos, N-A-O-S, that inner sanctuary specifically. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within His temple was seen the ark of His covenant. Now, boys and girls, don't make an error here and, and, uh, and assume that this is referring to Noah's ark. This is not referring to Noah's ark. It is referring to what is termed here the ark of the covenant. This is the, the chest, if you will that God commanded Moses to make in Exodus 25, verses 10 through 22, uh, where was held what? Where was held the, the uh, two stone tablets of the law? Where was held a jar of manna and Aaron's rod? 
It was a sign and symbol of God's power and a sign and symbol of God's presence and a sign and symbol of God's faithfulness to His covenant people. Now remember that and then think of that as we read, then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within His temple was seen the ark of the covenant. You know, it's interesting, historically, we don't really know what happened to the, the ark of the covenant. It's assumed by most that it was, it was destroyed in 586 BC when Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the city of Jerusalem and burned the temple to the ground. It's also interesting to note that the Jews have a legend which states that in the Messianic age, when the age of the Messiah is fully ushered in, the Ark of the Covenant will reappear. Uh, and this is noted, for example, in the uh, apocryphal book of 2 Maccabees 2, verses 4 through 8. I just share that as of historical interest to you. But it really makes no difference because we're not speaking here, are we, of the physical, literal, historical Ark of the Covenant. We're talking, are we not, of its heavenly prototype. The Ark of the Covenant beheld in the temple of our God. And think about this. As the church still must go through a brief time of horrendous tribulation, as we still, as the revelation goes on to tell us, must do battle with the dragon and with the great beast, as we go through problems and pressures and persecutions and trials and tribulations, God is saying, I am with you. I am with you. I am with my people. And not only so, I love you. I will be faithful to you. I will show you the sign and the seal of my promises and my covenant with you. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of our God. Think of it. Maybe you need to see that Ark tonight. Maybe I need to see that Ark tonight. The sign of God's presence and of His power with us. Now it's interesting when I read here, that the temple in heaven was opened and the ark was beheld. Where was the ark held, kept in the earthly temple? Do you know, boys and girls? It wasn't in the holy place. It was where? In the holy of holies. That's right. It was in the holy of holies. Where only the priest could go once a year on the day of atonement. And boys and girls, do you know what happened when our Lord Jesus was crucified? Do you know what happened to that great veil, that great curtain of the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies? Who knows? Say it out loud. It was ripped in half. All the boys and girls knew it. It was torn in two from top to bottom, symbolizing and signifying the access which Christ had earned and gained for us into the Father's presence. And so, brothers and sisters, is it any wonder... As we close, turn to Hebrews 10 with me for a moment. Hebrews chapter 10. Is it then any wonder that in Hebrews 10, verses 19 and following, Hebrews 10, 19 and following, we read this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain... It is His body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Indeed, brothers and sisters, not only so, but also as occurred so many years ago on Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. And as we also read in Revelation 4, Revelation 4, verse 5, before the throne of God, so too God puts an exclamation point on this exemplification of His power and of His promise as our text concludes with the words, look back with me in Revelation 11, those last few words, and there came flashes of lightning, think of it, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. God had presented 
the Ark of the Covenant for reassurance. And he said through those fearful heavenly phenomena, it's true. It's true. You know, many years ago, the great missionary to China, J. Hudson Taylor, said this concerning the Church of Jesus Christ. He said, we are a supernatural people, born again by a supernatural birth. We wage a supernatural fight, are taught by a supernatural teacher, and are led by a supernatural captain to assured victory. To assured victory. And you know, brothers and sisters, that's true. That's gloriously true. And because it is true, as you and I go forth from this place out into a brand new week, let us continue by the grace of God and the power of His Spirit to work and pray for the coming of that day. The day the Bible says will usher in a, a great sound of rejoicing. Great retribution. And also a blessed reassurance the day that will occur upon the sounding the seventh trumpet of judgment. Amen.